Hello YouTube, I have an excellent research project for you with one of my friends at the Hungarian Military Museum of Budapest. This is the time of the 17th century when the Turkish army invaded the southern and eastern part of Europe and the Habsburg army is trying to push it out of the Asian areas again. Both armies are equipped with a wide range of firearms like wheellock, flintlock and matchlock firearms and this is the time when the paper cartridges and the cartridge boxes are becoming more and more common on the battlefield and they are replacing the bandoliers on the soldiers. This is also the time when the first XRC reglement of the Habsburg army is written by Johann Sebastian Gruber and this is the time when the muskets equipped with bayonets are replacing the pikes on the battlefield forever now. The majority of the bullets fired by the soldiers by this time is the round ball, between 10 to 18 mm in diameter, but archaeologists also found many cut lead bars on the battlefields. This kind of bullets are very common in the Turkish Empire and they are described by the Count of Marsi in his book about the military system of the Turkish Empire. Today I'm going to compare the external ballistics, the accuracy and the wound ballistics of the cut lead bar against the traditional lead round ball. You're watching Cap and Ball TV and this is Balazs Nemet. We wanted to make a reasonably accurate copy of a human chest, so we borrowed some ribs from a wild boar. Making the gelatin blocks was a funny Sunday program. Sometimes it just felt like making a horror movie. After mixing the gelatin according to our secret recipe, we left it cool for 24 hours on 20 Celsius degrees. One suggestion to all the fellows planning to do this at home. Don't tell your wife what you are doing and don't use her dishes and buckets. Making the lead bar is easy. You do not need a precise mold. You can cut a groove into a piece of wood or you can use some planks to form a mold. One thing for sure, we did not measure anything to be historically accurate. Just used good old eye measure to set the sizes. The soldiers often carried spare bars in the bags for later use. A common way was to bend the lead into spiral form. These spirals are often found on battlefields as well. We used the accurate eye measure again when cutting the bar into bullets. I tried to be as accurate as possible and I was able to make bullets between 20 to 22 grams. The cutlet bar was always an auxiliary bullet when round ball was not available and today it is considered very inferior compared to the service balls. Now we will see if this statement is true on contemporary musket tactics ranges. Our musket for the job was my original Harper's Ferry musket that really does not have anything to do with the 17th century or Turkish army. But its caliber is very close to the most common 18mm caliber of the time and the bore is smooth, just like the bores of most of the guns of the Turkish wars. Setting the powder charge is not an easy task. Although we know the mixing recipe of the 17th century Habsburg musket powder and we know the weight of the charge, the size of the ball, the type of wedding, still we cannot replicate exactly the gas pressures of the original load. The 17th century powders were not granulated, they were only a mix of sulfur, charcoal and potassium nitrate. The strength of the powder depended on how much time it spent in the crushing mill. The longer the time was, the better the mix became, the stronger the powder became. The musket powder spent 16 to 20 hours in the mill. Even if we made an accurate copy of this powder, there is another factor we have to take care and it is the distance. The powder was loaded into kegs and transported to the armies or military depots by wagons. The longer the road was, the more the ingredients separated and settled by weight. This practically meant that there were different strengths of powder in different deepnesses in the keg. We also know from Gruben's regulation that the soldiers could use loose powder also to load the musket, not just paper cartridges. So what was the muzzle velocity of the bullet fired from a 17th century musket? We will never exactly know. So we decided to use a charge of 90 grains of 1.5 F Swiss powder as a reference. I loaded the 24 gram 15.9mm powder between two cardboard beds. It left the bore with 414 meters per second. I used the same load and same wed with the cutlet bullet. It fell easily onto the powder without the need of ramming it down. I was expecting a higher muzzle velocity as the weight of the cut lead was 3-4 grams less than the weight of the ball. The average size of the lead columns was 20 by 10 by 12 millimeters.
In fact, the muzzle velocity was more than 10% less than with the round ball. This is caused by the inadequate form of the rectangular lead bar that leaves much more space for the gases to escape than the round ball that seals the burning powder much better. I shot the 5 shots to a human sized target at 50 paces or about 37 meters. I aimed at the area of the stomach. I used the same loading method as it was described in Gruben's regulations. The ball was 1.7 mm smaller than the bore and I did not use any patch. The bullets hit the upper body and only one missed the hit area of the target. Same loading method, same powder, same wedding were used for the lead bars again. We were amazed to see that there is not such a great difference between the accuracy of the round ball and the lead bar. Yeah. We only had one less hit on the target. It was easy to differentiate the bullet holes as the bars cut nice rectangular shapes in the paper. We placed some canvas in front of the gelatin block to simulate the close of the soldier. I brought back the block to 5 meters and reduced the powder load to simulate 50 paces impact. This was necessary for placing the shot well. Let's check the round ball first. Same distance, same load, same simulated 50 paces impact for the lead bar bullets. The lead bar made a stronger cut when it entered the gelatin, and its energy transfer capabilities were better than the round balls, but it had less penetration. It was clearly visible also that the bullet turned several times in the wound. It stopped in the middle of the second gelatin block. The bullet took particles of the cloth into the wound. These particles could cause lethal infections even if the soldier survived the shot. It broke the bone and continued its way straight. It destroyed about one centimeter from the bone and crushed it to powder and spread it deep into the central cavity. The instability of the bar caused a strong energy transfer and heavy damage to the surrounding tissue as well. The bullet was deformed, a bit mushroomed on the side, which hit the gelatin, but did not lose any of the original weight. The round ball traveled a longer distance in the gelatin and made a thinner central cavity than the cutlet bar. The damage to the surrounding tissue was a bit less as well, just like the size of the entrance wound. The ball crushed the bone just like the bar did, and it also took the cloth into the bone deep. A small lead particle detached from the ball. The round ball seemed much more deformed than the bar. Maybe this is caused by the bigger impact energy. And here is the summary of the wound ballistics. The round ball had much better penetration, higher velocity, more energy and better accuracy, while the lead bar had a better energy transfer, made bigger central cavity and greater damage to the surrounding tissue. The round ball deformed more and lost one particle also. The lead bar turned at least three times in the wound, causing additional damage. 
Although I have quite a few new questions in my mind and some future plans for experiments with the two bullets, I cannot tell you that the difference between the two kinds of bullets are too big. Of course at contemporary musket tactics ranges. The cutlet offered easy logistics and solved the problem of different caliber guns also. And at the contemporary firing ranges it was not less effective than the round ball.